It's about this time of year that Mike asked me to step in and give a message when he and Donna go on vacation. And I just first of all want to say that um, how much I appreciate Mike. All it takes is spending some time trying to come up with a message, <laughs> you know, when you don't do it every day. And you go, wow, Mike, you do this every flippin' Sunday. I, I, I love you. Keep it up. <laughs> go for it, buddy. But anyway, I so appreciate Mike and Donna, and so I know they're watching, and, and so we uh, love them, and we just thank you. Uh, we, we thank God that we have them Amen. as our pastor right. and his lovely wife. So, Mike, it's to you. So anyway, um, it's January, I'm stepping in for Mike, going to give a message for him. So this time last year was the same situation. So Mike said, would you give a message? And he said, I, t I told you what. I said, you know, I'd like to give a message. And boy, I got this great idea. It's 2020. So, you know, I, I got this message. It's going to be 2020 vision for 2020. I mean, you know, 2020 vision, isn't that cool? He, he looked at me like, oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's real unique. <laughs> you know, a lot of pastors are going to wear that one out. You know, I said, oh, okay, well, darn. I said, I had this idea that I wanted to start it out with that Johnny Nash song, you know, from the 70s, that great hit. You know what that one is? Bob up, bob up, bob up. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Bob up, bob up, bob up. I can see all obstacles way out there in my way. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny year, right? Well, I'm glad I didn't give that message, huh? I think I'd have lost that by a country mile. <laughs> because we were blindsided, boom, right? With this whole pandemic thing and Black Lives Matter and protests and defunding police. And I, mean, I didn't know what was going on. It's like the country's going down the toity, you know? What are we doing? An isolated, pent up, the whole nine yards. And, um, and the thing that got me as a banker is they're printing all this money. Not millions, not billions. There was a famous senator down at the, back in the time of Mike Mansfield named Everett Dirksen. Ever, you know what Everett Dirksen was? And he had this famous saying, he says, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon it adds up to real money. Only this ain't billions, this is trillions. That's a million millions. And they just pull it right out of thin air out of that cloud where you send your stuff up to when you save it up there. <laughs> we're going to save our stuff to the cloud and then we're going to pull our money out of there. Pull it out of the cloud and spend it. We're going to keep this economy going. Things were sailing along so good, weren't they? And then, boom. Panic and fear and no toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, it was a crazy year. But the sad thing is, and, and more on a serious note, you know, is people pinning their hopes on this life on what it has to offer, pinning their hopes on their efforts, their jobs, their careers, and where they're headed to that nice, cushy retirement, pinning their hopes, pinning their hopes on something that with a pandemic could just vanish, boom, gone. King Solomon in a, a Ecclesiastes, he wrote, anybody wrote, read the book of Ecclesiastes? Yeah. You know what that's about? He starts it off with this Debbie Downer tone. King, <laughs> King Solomon says, Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Oh, way to start. I want to, okay, let's find a new book to read. <laughs> That's Debbie Downer, wouldn't you say? And he gets to the 14th verse of that first chapter, and he says, um, I've seen everything done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Ever seen a dog, puppy chase its tail? Well, That's the world. Round and round we go, gerbil on a treadmill, right? And the general theme of Ecclesiastes is how meaningless life is without God, right? right? But hey, he turns, he changes directions, he switches gear, and he drops the Debbie Downer. On, on, in, in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, ah, but everything, God does everything beautiful in its time. And right after that, he says, this, he says, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Each and every one of you sitting here, God has placed eternity in your hearts. Amen. 
I thought, you know, that's, that explains some things to me, you know, why life is so unsatisfactory, the grind, you know? You know, I wonder if biblical people say we've got this big God-shaped hole in our soul. But I think right there it says it. God has placed eternity in our hearts. Nothing's going to satisfy unless there's an eternity, a, eternal purpose. I worked at the bank for 35 years and I had a real wealthy, successful business. He had three companies, all of them real profitable, all financially strong. And he comes in one day and good to see him. What can we loan, <laughs> what can we loan you today? And he looked at me, he says... I sold the businesses, and I'm going to pay you off. I, I, what? Uh, uh, um, hmm? S say that again? He said, I'm paying you off. I, I said, why? He said, I'm sick of the rat race. That's all he said. He didn't say anymore. He was a guy of very few words. I'm sick of the rat race. Like King Solomon, I think he started to feel it's a chasing after the wind, a grasping at the air, right? And it made me think as a banker, you know, I'm getting up every morning, putting on my, taking a shower, putting on my suit, eating breakfast, cross the bridge over the Missouri, go to the bank, put in my day, leave the bank, cross the bridge, come back home, take off my suit, not talk to my wife and kids for two hours because I'm in the zone, I'm in the numbness of it all. And I just thought, you know, vanity of vanities, emptiness, meaningless. You just get there, you know? And every now and then I'd say, Janiel, grab the kids, throw them in the van, we're getting out of here. We're going somewhere, I don't know, we're going somewhere, we're just taking off. We, so I was known as the dad of the impromptu vacation. <laughs> Not planned, we just take off and go. And uh, you know, I think this is kind of an idea of where I came, where God was speaking to me with this message, is I think it's the same way with Jesus. He looks down and says, you know, I think I need, you get, I need to get you out of here. I think you need out of here. I think you need to go someplace else. And so my first point today is Jesus makes us an invitation. If you could put that first slide up there. And it, or maybe you had it up already. It was the one before that. Jesus' invitation is, I want to take you on a journey. And the journey God wants to take us on is one of uh, taking us somewhere. He has somewhere in mind. But there's also all the points in between. That's the interesting part of the trip. And it's all about movement. Last week, Mike said you'd be hearing a lot about movement. Well, here's my first installment about movement. And it's not aimless. God is taking us someplace to a destination, a place that's better than where we are right now. And with that invitation, Jesus says, and you've heard his words. Think of an invitation word of Jesus. Can you think of one? Come, right? Come to me. Come to me, all you who I want to change your position. All you who I want to take you from here, and I want to take you to there. And follow. Follow me. Follow me, and I will make you into something better than you were. I'm going to make you useful. I'm going to give you something eternal to fill that eternity that's in your heart. And Jesus is all about life. The whole book of John, the theme is life, 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 right? And life is movement. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then he said, I came to, to give you what? Life and to give it to you in abundance. Jesus is all about life and he's all about movement. You know, if something isn't moving after a little bit of time, it's probably what? Dead. You got it, Christina. If it's not moving after a while, it's dead. Jesus is the quintessential movement man. Mike gave, uh, get shared with me an illustration once about God and movement. And I want to share that with you. It has to do... How many have been to the Holy Land here? Some of you have been to the Holy Land. He gave me this illustration. It's right in the Holy Land, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. So the Sea of Galilee is up here, right? And the Jordan's running in and the Jordan's running out. And it's going all the way down to what other place? Anybody know where it's going? The Dead Sea, right? 
So here I have this Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is known, of, known as one of those places, known as one of the most biologically diverse places on the planet. I mean, the, the, the stuff that's in there is incredible for, for biological diversity. But the water's flowing in and the water's flowing out. But where does it go? The Jordan goes to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is one of the most toxic, deadly places there are. Nothing can live in it. So Jesus wants to take us on a journey. He's inviting us to go on a journey with him, and he wants movement in our lives. He wants to move us. He wants to move in us. He wants to move through us. And he wants to move out of us to touch others. So my message today is, here it is, a journey with Christ from belonging to longing. So before we can start with this journey, God has to deal with this issue if we're going to go on this journey with him. He has to start with this issue of belonging. So I'm going to really work this. It's going to kind of be foundational for the next few weeks. When I was a little boy, I'm going to have, by the way, I'm going to have a lot of little boy, rocky little boy uh, um, illustrations today. I just worked out that way. So you're going to be going. So it's going to get personal and I'm going to act like a little boy. I don't know. But I have a lot of little boy illustrations. But anyway, back when I was a little boy, I remember I took, I, take a, I took a shovel down to the creek to dig worms so I could go fishing, right? So I went down there, dug the worms, went fishing, and I left my shovel along the bank. My grandpa came by and said, I saw that shovel down there. You left it there? I said, yeah. He says, why don't you take the shovel back and put it where it belongs, in the tool shed. And I remember also my grandmother, I was helping her clean up after like a bridal or baby shower or something. She says, I want you to take the dining room chairs and I want you to put them in the dining room where they what? Where they belong. So belonging really has three kind of uses. You can go to the dictionary and find it. There's three basic uses. One of them has to do with location. This doesn't belong here. It does belong here. It has a rightful place. It has a rightful location. But it also can be used with relationship. Not where it belongs, but to what it belongs. Like in relationships with people, right? You hear somebody, like I look up in uh, Caleb and Naomi this morning, and look up and say, oh, what a cute couple. Don't they belong together? Yeah, they belong with each other. It's a right relationship. They belong there. That's where they belong. And the third has to do with ownership. Something belongs to something. Something belongs to me. That new pickup, right? You want to go and shine it up and it looks so nice? That pickup belongs to me. So it has to do with ownership. So three things, location, relationship, and ownership. All belonging, right? So belonging has some pretty interesting concepts when it comes to Jesus. I just want to say that. Of course, what do they say if you have a lot of debt on the pickup? Then who does it belong to? Oh, the bank. Yeah, I knew you'd get that one right. But anyway, I want to tell this story. And this story has a lot. Of, this story, I shared it before years ago on a sermon. I'm going to share it again because it really is key to this idea. And it has a special uh, spot in my heart. And uh, it's about a runaway orphan child. This little boy leaves the orphanage or where, the foster care, wherever he's been abused, and he, and he takes off. And he's on the run, and this man and his son see him running away. They see him off in the distance, and this man and his son are playing together in the park. And so they beckon him to come over. Come join us. Come join us. Come over here. So the child comes over with them, and the two little boys play. They play together for a long period of time. And then, the, then the, the man's son says, Dad, can we ask him over for supper? So he comes over for supper, and the boys continue to play and watch TV. And at the very latest, uh, toward the late, it's getting uh, late in the evening, the dad goes to the little orphan boy and says, isn't it time for you to go home now? Um, I think you should leave. And the little boy said, I, I really don't have any place to go. And I took the dad back. And the dad said, ooh, well, we got a problem here because I'm not responsible for you. I, you're not my son. I'm not your father. And then he said some words that pierced that little boy's heart. He said, you don't belong here. Sad. 
And while I was writing this sermon, God put something on my heart to share that I wouldn't have shared, but he put it on my heart. It challenged me. And it has to do with this whole racial thing that's going on right now. And I don't think it's really good to bring up a lot of stuff like that in sermons. I think you just stick it to Jesus, keep it to Jesus. But I felt God's wanting me to say this, so I'm going to throw it out there. It was a challenge to me. But I think there's a lot of certain people groups out there, minorities, that feel unwanted, unwelcome, overlooked. They feel in their heart that they what? They don't belong. A KKK uh, man was interviewed, and he said, why do you hate black people so much? He says, because they don't belong here. Wow. So I started to ponder this Black Lives Matter thing and this defund the police thing, which is stirring me up, you know. And I said, God said, I want, you to, I want you to take a different angle on this. I said, what, Lord? I want you to take a little different approach. I said, oh. And it wasn't long. I was watching television, and there's this black man who identifies as black, and he just was giving his ancestral DNA information. And this guy's, well, what does it say? And he opens it up, and he's blown away. He's slightly more white than he is black. And so the man says, well, how does this make you feel about the whole Black Lives Matter thing? He says, it doesn't change a thing. I still feel hollow, empty. I feel pain about my blackness, whatever percentage it is. And so I really think it's an issue of belonging. And God said, look at you, Rock. I took you from not belonging to a place of belonging. I took you from bondage to freedom. This man's ancestors were taking the opposite way, from freedom to bondage, from a place they did belong to a place they didn't belong. And the light came on. Why are they, 150 years since Emancipation Proclamation, 60 years since the Civil Rights Movement, we're all here together, get over it. Until I realize the problem is, is they're still here. They're still in the place where their forefathers were enslaved, not their promised land. Still in the place where their ancestors were bought and sold. So there it is. I shared it. It was tough for me to go there, for God to show me this. But what we think where they should be and what they're feeling in their heart are two different things. What they're hearing deep down is what? Like that little boy. You don't belong here. And so the story of the little orphan boy keeps going, though. That's a nice thing. The story isn't over. Because after the man sat there a while, he went back to the little boy and he said, you know, I saw you playing with my son. And I can tell he loves you and you love him. So, I think you belong in this family. I want to make you mine. So because you love my son, I want to make you mine. The Bible says we're all adopted into the family of God. We, we once were not a people, now we are a people of God. And what gives us that, what emboldened us and gives us that strength is that we belong now. We belong. We don't have that nagging inside of us question going, we don't belong. I don't even understand, but we don't belong. Belonging is so key to who we are. And the reason this story is so central, so personal for me, is I grew up out on the ranch, another little boy's story again. But my dad custom built a bale sweep for me just big enough so I could get an old 52 Chevy pickup. He turned it around with a straight 235 Chevy motor in it. 
He built that thing just for me so I could reach the clutch and I could shift with my left hand and I could go buck bales, eight, eight little square bales at a time. And I had horrible asthma and hay fever. And I dreaded going out there, being pelleted in the face with second cutting alfalfa dust, my eyes swelling up. Well, one morning I was greasing my sweep and I banged my head on the, on the iron frame of the, of the bed. And I threw the grease gun down and I stuck my fist and I cursed heaven. I told God everything I thought about him. And you know what? Jesus spoke to me and said, that was the day. That was the day I looked down in you and I saw your swollen red eyes and I saw your snotty nose and I saw your, your labored breathing and your anger and your pain and your frustration and I said, I choose you. I want you to be mine belonging. That's the cross of Jesus Christ. The perfect sacrifice who came and bled and died so that we could belong to him. Ownership. He bought and paid for us, it said. He paid for us with his blood. He owns us. Ownership. But he's not a God that just wanted to stay in heaven and we're down here and call on him when we need him. No, he says, I, I don't just want you to belong to me. I want you to belong with me. I want you with me. I want to be with you. Relationship. Ownership. Relationship. And I love you so much, I don't want you to stay where you're at. I want to move your location. I want to take you from here, and I want to take you to a better place there. Location. So my point is this. In a journey with Christ, it's all about belonging. That's what it's about. So whose journey, journey though, is it really? So if I belong to him, and he's with me, and he's taking care of me, and he's the one doing the heavy lifting, whose journey really is it? Oh, he said, it's my journey, and God's going along with me, you know, the footprints thing, and he's helping me along. But I started thinking like Paul. I started getting the mentality of Paul, the apostle Paul. You know him, right? Pretty radical guy. Radical disciple. And I started looking at things a little bit differently. You know, if, I, if I'm part of him and it's about him, it's probably his journey, right? And he knows where he's going. But you know, the funny thing is, he's not saying. And who are we? We always want to know, hey, where are we going? You know, oh, where are we going? Are we there yet, dad? You know? and, and on the journey, we're curious. We want to know all those points in between on the journey. But God says, no, I'm not telling you. So my next point is on the journey, there's no itinerary. Can we get that one? There's no itinerary. A man came to Mother Teresa and asked for prayer. And she says, what can, we, what, what can I pray for you? What, what is it you need? And, Mother, and the guy said, I just want clarity. And she says, I'm not going to pray for you then. And he said, what? <laughs> I'm not going to pray for you. Why? He says, then you won't trust Jesus. You won't need him. And the other thing too is I think God wants it to be a surprise. I think he wants to turn that adventure into, a, or that journey into adventure where we're excited to see what's around the band. We don't know what's. How many of you like surprises? How many don't like surprises? Yeah, so there's both, right? I like surprises if they're a pleasant surprise. You when you hear people say, oh, what a pleasant surprise. I like it when it's a pleasant surprise. But not all surprises are pleasant. And in our journey with Christ, it's not always going to be pleasant. It's going to be challenging, right? I think Mother Teresa knew that. I, don't think, I think we should never think that our journey with Jesus is just this joy ride, a carnival ride we get on, and it's an exhilarating ride, and five minutes later we step off. I think it's more to me, it's more like walking the Continental Divide, spending a week on a mule pack trip or something like that, where you have the darkness of night, you know, the light of day. You have the steep, narrow 
edges with a cliff where you could fall to your death, and in the valleys you've got grizzly bears and poison oak and, and the mosquitoes. Oh, I hate mosquitoes. All those kind of things. It's a challenging, challenging walk, this journey that Jesus takes on. So we need, we need the trail guide. We need Jesus. So why, why do you think God would not share with us the d- details of the trip? Why does he say, I'm not telling you? Why would he not share the details from where we start with him and our belonging and where he's taking us to our final destination? I had to think about this. I think there's a couple reasons. One reason is, is if we think we can go it alone, we will, right? But Jesus didn't want it that way. He said, I want relationship with you. I want to go with you. You need me. I want you to go along with me. You see, if we think we can get there by ourselves, we might end up in the wrong destination. Proverbs 16.25 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to what? Death. Ooh, no movement there. Don't want to get to that wrong destination. Another boyhood story, holy smokes. So my, friend, uh, my childhood friend, Joe Delwell, anybody know Joe Delwell? He's a county commissioner, Teton County Commissioner. So we're little boys, and uh, he invites me to come spend the night up at the ranch, that's the Pollock Ranch, way up in the base of the black, black leaf up here. And his two cousins, Bob and, uh, Bob and Karen Custer, come along with him. And so we're up there together, we spend the night, and the next day we all decide we're going to leave uh, Larry and Ann's cabin, and we're going to walk over to Oregale Knowlton's house. Well, it's a mile or so, so we start walking. I get this crazy idea that I think there's a quicker way there. I'm hardly ever up there, but I get this crazy idea, I'm going to get there before them, right? So I don't tell them, I just start walking a different way, and they're looking, like, where are you going? So I just kind of, st- and I went around the Quake and Aspens, and I got lost, and pretty soon, I, the first set of buildings I could see I headed to, and it was the main ranch, two miles to the east. And I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I had ended up in the wrong destination. I think that's a danger when we think we can see the clear path. We think we got it figured out. We can get there on our own. The second reason I think that God doesn't show us the details, why he doesn't hand us the itinerary, is because I think for some of us, unlike the others, if we could see what's ahead, we'd say what? (laughs) Going over there. That's scary. Another boyhood story. It it just keeps it coming. So boyhood story number umpteen millionth here. So um, we used to stack hay with little squares, like I said, bring the hay to the stack, and we'd stack hay with little square bales, way before we moved to large round bales. And I was a little boy, my dad would be the one stacking hay, because he was a strong guy, and he had the most endurance, and we'd stack hay, and we'd just keep going higher and higher and higher and higher. Pretty soon we'd get up, and they'd go as high as the bale sweep lift would go. And that's as high as we went, and we got up there. Sometimes he'd, they'd, they'd tip it upwards, and my dad would pull it off just to get one more, one more tier on the stack, you know, and just to see if the sides of the stack would buckle and fall apart, you know. We made it fun, or my dad would make it fun. So now I'm up there as a little boy with my dad on top of the stack, and I'm three years old. Dad climbs down, and he says, jump, I'll catch you three years old, I'd, I'd run off there and jump, and he'd catch me. And I got six years old. Yeah. Run and jump. And I went to the edge, and I looked. I wouldn't jump. I started thinking, there might be a chance my daddy would drop me, or he wouldn't catch me. If we can see clearly, some of us would say, I don't think my daddy can catch me. I don't think you'll see me through. I think we have a scripture next now. It's Isaiah 42, 16. I will lead the blind by the ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. 
I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. This is all the things I will do. I will not forsake them. It's Jesus. He leads us, and we're what? We're blind. We can't see. Crazy. He wants us blind. <laughs> he doesn't want to think we can just take it from here. That happens a lot in ministry, I think. We just say, Jesus, you've shown us so much. I think that's how some of these movements start. And they make it all about that movement because they get this deposit of wonderful epiphany, enlightenment, and Jesus says that's good. But then the problem is, is they say, okay, I think I got enough. See ya, Jesus, I think I can take it from here. I think I'll build ministries and everything around all this great stuff Jesus gives, me, gives them. But what? It's because I think I got enough. I can, I, I can take it from here, Jesus. I can go. Mike talked about fads and movements. It weren't the scoop shovel that moves the grain. It's the rake that smooths the pile. Be careful to understand why God says you're blind. When they're unfamiliar paths. A path is what's designed for us to, to go on, right? The path is there for us to move on, but it's unfamiliar. Jesus has been there before, but we haven't. And so we need his Holy Spirit. We need his Spirit inside us, guiding us the way. Shining, it says he'll turn darkness into light before them. So as I take each step, light. Oh, light, light. And I walk on, following him, listening to him. Okay, next step, well, there it is. Is it always that intense? I don't know that it is. But that's the safest place to be. It's every step. John 8, 47 says, he who belongs to God, there's that belong word again, he who belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is you do not belong to God. If we belong to God, we gotta use this, we gotta listen, listen. For the next step, the next instructions. Galatians 5.25 is the next scripture. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step. I was thinking about that. That's the smallest segment you can have in a journey, right? Is a step. One more step. How do you eat an elephant? One step. Oh, bite. Step at a time. One step. To me, it smacks of intimacy with God, doesn't it? Each little step. I look at a couple sitting here, the Crawfords. I was around them once, they said, uh, Mr. Jesse looks at Rose says, okay, uh, we're not doing this. What's, what's the Lord showing you? Let's pray about this. I don't want to take that step until I hear, is this right? Crazy couple, I don't know. It's a little out there if you ask me. Each step listening to God. Not the clear path all the way to the finish line or some segment. Then we'll do it ourselves or we won't go at all. Each step, he shines the light, turning darkness into light each step of the way. Isaiah 42, 19, just a few verses after that first one. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me? Blind like the servant of the Lord. When you're blind, you're all in the journey. When you're blind, you're all in. I mean, you're holding on to that sighted person, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, with everything you got. You're clinging to the sighted person. Otherwise, you're going to go over the cliff. You're all in. And it's by the Spirit of Christ that guides us. And we say, God, you're in control. You're in control. You know, a lot of that control is the control we give him. Lord, you take, the, I, you, you take control. You're Holy Spirit. I give you control. I believe you're a better driver than I am. 
My dad's got macular degeneration, and so my mom does the driving because he knows she ain't going to wreck him. She isn't going to crash him, you know, run in the barrel pit. Jesus, take the wheel. You're in control. Romans 8 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, they do not belong to God. We're controlled by his spirit. In the realm of the spirit. The other transla- another translation, the, the old NIV, I think this is the new NIV, the old NIV is we're controlled by the spirit. He has control of us. So my next point is this. On the journey, we're blind because he's able. The credit goes to him. He makes the journey happen. His Holy Spirit. We're, the Bible says we're sealed with his Holy Spirit. you know that? We're sealed with a mark of his ownership that we belong to him. And in that same verse, in 2 Corinthians, I believe, it says that it guarantees what is to come, Right? We belong, we're marked with a seal, guided by the Holy Spirit. We're gonna, it's a guarantee we're gonna make it to what is promised for us, the place that we're going. Jude 24. To him is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. He's able, right? We're blind because he's able. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to all his power that works within us, right? The Holy Spirit. So so that's why we're blind. That's why we don't have the itinerary. That's why we can't see everything. God doesn't want us to see everything that's ahead, right? So we've answered the question, okay, Lord, I'm blind, I cling to you, I trust in you, I depend on you, I, you know, you're in control of my life through your spirit all the way, but I have a question, because my wife asked it, and that's, uh, what do we get to pack on the trip? What do we get to take along? We're going on a journey, right? I'm blaming this on Janiel. So Janiel and I have been a lot of trips uh, to Europe because we have friends over there and they soften the blow of the cost and everything. And uh, we always have a trouble, how much are we going to pack? You know? Because, you know, it's, it's human nature. I, I think we need to pack. You always overpack. I might need that, you know? I just might need that blow dryer. I just might need that, what, you know, that book because I might want to read this book, although it might make my weight limit too high. I just might need those things. What do you think Jesus' answer is to that question? Jesus, what do I get to pack? Somebody was going to say it, just one word. Nothing. Who said that? Back there, Larry, you win the prize. Nothing! You get to bring nothing! I don't know why I'm doing it that way. <laughs> it's the only thing you're going to remember on this sermon. Janelle, I used to try to memorize scriptures, and she had a hard time with this one scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 30. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as come unto man, but God is faithful. Not something to be tempted above your, your able, but with that, we'll, we'll take away the, <laughs> the temptation so you can easily bear it. And she can never get the first few words, so I go, there hath no. There hath no. And the only thing she remembered was, there hath no <laughs> temptation taken you. So you'll remember that part. Nothing! (laughs) Jesus says, take nothing. When he sent the disciples out, empowered to heal the sick and cleanse the temple, or uh, the temple, cleanse the lepers, and proclaim the good news, he said, and take with you no staff, no bag, no bread, no lunch, nothing to eat, no money, Nothing to buy a hot dog? No money. No tunic? What if, what if we need to throw on a jacket? What if it gets cold? No tunic. Pretty much nothing. But Jesus, he's enough. He provides supernaturally. 
It's interesting that the next, that the next text of scripture after the sending out of the, of the 12 is, talks about what? Jesus doing what? Feeding the 5,000. Wow. Talk about taking nothing and doing something right after the sending them out and telling them to take nothing. There's this TV show, don't judge me, but I watched it. It's called Naked and Afraid. <laughs> Anybody heard of the show called Naked and Afraid? Okay, don't get all wigged out. They fuzz out the tender parts. Okay. <laughs> but they take these two people, opposite sex, of course, you know. Why couldn't it be two dudes or two women? But no, it's a man and a woman. And a lot of times they're married to somebody. I go, what? And so they take these survival type people and they take them out to the bush or out to the jungle and they drop them off and say, okay, you get to take your pick, you get one thing. Oh, this person picks a machete or that one picks a fire starter because you've got to start a fire because the first thing you got to do is you got to stay warm, right? And so they go on this survival thing, got 21 days to stare each other's naked bodies, but they got to get past it because they got to stay alive for 21 days. And so they do teamwork and all this stuff to, to make it. But I thought, you know, what's so significant about that? The only thing I could get out of it is the first thing they had to do was strip down. They had to take it all off. Leave it back. Let it go. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I'm bare, baby. I'm bare. <laughs> so what? Could you strip down if Jesus said, take nothing? Could you strip down? What is it that you couldn't let go of? So if we belong to Jesus, right? We, we're his possession. He owns us, bought us with his blood then how can we ever think that any of our stuff is ours? A lot of us are living in a playground. We're having fun with our toys and our stuff. It's not your stuff if you go on the journey. Because he said, don't take it with, let it go. The rich young ruler came up to Jesus and said, I want to follow you. What did Jesus say? Get rid of it. And the rich young, ruler's big, rich young ruler's problem was he thought it was his. I like my stuff. I want my stuff. I'm a wealthy guy. I got position in this community. Thank you very much. Let it go. Take nothing. It's not yours. It's God's. Psalm 24 says, the earth is God's and Everything in it. Is that just your possessions? No. It's your profession. It's your education, your talents and abilities. Yet, however you got those, you got by stuff God gave you. The brain to go learn. If you're a professional musician, the talent to be able to play the instrument, it all came from God. I'm getting a little lathered up, so... Take it down a notch. So the next point is on the journey, we're empty-handed because he's enough. He's enough. I want to go Paul. Paul's a radical guy, right? Paul is a guy that wrote most of the New Testament. Well, not actually. Luke wrote more words and verses, but Paul, more kind of stuff we notice. Paul's a radical guy. Paul said, you know... I have reason to be confident in my flesh. I have reason to say, I can bring something to the table. I can take stuff with me so that I can see ahead on my own. I can make something happen here. But then there's this verse. This is Paul, Philippians 3. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. In verse 8. The next verse, please. What is more, I consider everything loss. Everything. Not just Bob and Janet. I consider everything loss. I was supposed to be funny. I'm sorry, Bob. Sorry, Janet. I consider everything loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost, let it go, took nothing, 
He says, I consider them garbage. Ooh. None of you are going to take garbage on the trip with you. No one's going to take that on the journey with them. Now, here's Paul's heart. Paul says, Jesus, I'm going blind. I'm taking nothing. It's all rubbish. I just want to know you. And your surpassing worth of that, of just knowing you. That's all Paul went on the journey for. Journey that Paul went on was just to know Jesus. We're going to go up the hill and it's going to get steep. I don't care. I just want to know you. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. And we're going to go down. It's going to get pretty bad. You're on the journey with me. It's going to get tough. I don't care. I just want to know you. I want to know you in the fellowship of your suffering. I just want to know you. I want to identify with you. It's not about me. It's not me. It's not my journey. It's you. I want to get to know you. That's the heart of Paul. So we accepted Jesus to go on a journey with him. We know we belong to him. We know we belong with him. And he has in mind a place that we belong, that he's taken us. And what starts to happen now is we go from this place of belonging to a place of longing. Because guess what happens when we join the journey, when we belong to Christ? Our, D- our ancestral DNA, DNA changed. It became like Abraham's. Put up Galatians 3.20. If you belong to Christ, there's that belong word again. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. We now have Abraham's genes, 100%. Abraham was a sojourner. He was longing for a different place, wasn't he? He was longing for a heavenly home. And so to end now, I want to end with one more verse and a final point. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. Let's read those together. So now put yourself in Abraham's position. You belong to him. You've decided to go on this journey, right? By faith, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance... He obeyed and went, even though what? Didn't know where he was going. Blind. Verse 10. Next verse, please. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. Start feeling like a stranger here when you go on the journey. The closer you get, the more you don't fit here. I'll tell you what, I had lots of friends. You can tell I'm a talkative gabber, aren't I? I had lots of friends, a popular guy. I could get to know anybody. Lost a lot of friends. Because I could tell they thought I didn't fit with them anymore. I didn't fit and belong. Belong somewhere else. So you get to feel like a stranger here. And that belonging starts to develop into something called longing. So the last point is this. On the journey, we long for our destination. So if the worship team would come up and our prayer people I guess I want to ask you, do you know that you belong to Jesus? Do you know that, you, that you're his possession? That he bought and paid for you with his blood and your life is his? If you don't know that, I ask you to come pray with these people right here. And they'll get you on on that journey. And it starts with belonging, ownership. And there's some of you here that you know you belong to him, but you haven't been with him much. He's a God that's kind of way up there and you're down here. Like a vending machine, you try to put the quarter in 
and put in a prayer to get what your needs are once in a while when you really need him. But he says, no, I want, I want you with me, want me to, I want you to want me with you all along the journey. And right now, some of you are saying, you know, I, I, I got to take more seriously that step-by-step thing. I need to be step-by-step, every step, letting him shine the light, listening. All of those things prove that you belong to him. Is any of you coming out of this COVID thing and, and protests and what's happening now with the change of our presidency, can you pin your hopes on any of that? I can't. It's time to get serious about the journey. It goes for me too. And it's a privilege to speak to all of you about this, but I gotta tell you one thing. I'm not up here because I deserve to be. I don't speak things because I got it all figured out. I only speak what God shows me to speak when I pray. And I'm learning. I think that's why a lot of this sermon has touched my heart is because I want to be there too. I want to be step by step with him, listening, actively listening and obeying and following. If any of you are there and you just, you just feel in turmoil, you just feel disconnected from God, you want to get that relationship back, you want to start that journey fresh again, come up and pray with these people. I think something special will happen. This is the start of a new year. So Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But he wants to be everything in between, everything in between, every step of the way. He wants you to be like Paul and say, I just want to go on this trip to be with him. I love being with Janiel. I, I don't know what life would be with, like without her if I couldn't be with her every day. But more importantly, it's Jesus that we should have that feeling about. Lord, I, every day you get up and say, Lord, I don't know. I just want you. Shine the light on my steps. Speak something to me. I just want you. That's what I want world's messed up, going down the toilet, whatever it's going to do, doesn't matter. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. I want to know you in the fellowship of your suffering, the ups and the downs, whatever. I just want you. So come on up. We're going to continue to worship, but let me just pray. I'm going to just pray before we end here for all of you. Lord, I just thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Lord, I pray that the words you've given me would would touch people's heart, that they understand the idea of belonging to you and belonging with you and belonging on that journey from point A to point B with you. And I just pray, Father, you just give them a strength to get back with it and get back with you. That 2021 would be a year so different in their lives than 2020. Thank you. So let's just worship together now. Come up and get prayer for those of you that need it.